Here comes one. All right, and if you're staying with us, take your Bibles and turn with me to Joshua. I'm going to attempt this morning to um, preach uh, a sermon, and um, we're going to ordain uh, two new deacons today. And so my goal is to be done preaching by, I don't know, 20 till, quarter till. And so that's the goal. Y'all start waving me down um, because we got four points in the message we got to get rolling, all right? So, um, Joshua chapter 7, um, as uh, we jump in here where we left off um, the last time. So, this is the story of, I'm going to call it AI. Some people pronounce it I, and my sound funny when I say it, just I. So, it's going to be AI today. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. It says, but the people of Israel broke faith. In regards to the devoted things, for Achan, the son of Karma, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel. And said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up, uh, went up there from the people. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them from before the gate as far as Sherebim and struck them them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas! Oh, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say? When Israel has turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the earth, of the land, will hear of it and surround us and cut off, uh, cut off our name from the earth, and what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, they have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them, they have taken some of the devoted things, and they have stolen and lied and put them among their belongings." And therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. And I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for today. We thank you for the truth of Scripture. We thank you for... Uh, the love that you have poured out upon us. We pray that you would anoint me to preach. We pray that you would anoint this congregation to hear. Uh, God, that we would all leave here transformed, changed, uh, to be more like your son. Um, Speak to us now. Do a work in our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. and Amen. Um, This, and I know you can't see this. You can pass it around later because it's a little monetary value, and I have one more of them. Um, And so this is a piece of pottery, okay? Um, It's a piece of pottery. It's a jug handle. If you can picture a jug, it sits on there like this, okay? And so they would pick up the jugs like so, okay? So that's a, that's a, a, a jug handle. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, so Anyway, there's a jug handle here, and I picked up this jug handle. You can see when you take a look at it up close, it's dark in the center, 
uh, around the edges. It's thick. It comes from the Bronze Era, the late Bronze Era. And why that's important is because uh, I got the opportunity while I was in seminary to go to the Promised Land. Got a chance to go to Israel and go on an archaeological dig. And so I put a couple of those pictures up here so you can see what we did, what AI looks like now. This was our dig site, and if you ha don't have a picture of AI, this is it, okay? So you can see our little, we were working with the Associates of Biblical Research, uh, and so my square, because we all got squares, my square is the farthest one to the right and the closest one to us. And so there with the, the blue-shirted um, lady there in the picture. Okay, go to the next one. Now this is a picture of me digging. And my back, even at 20 whatever, um, I was out, my back was hurting after several days. We dug for three weeks, Monday to Friday. And on the weekends, we toured uh, and then went to Egypt for a couple of days. But I had found a piece of pottery. I don't know if it was that piece of pottery, but you know, we didn't find a whole lot in my dig site with the exception uh, of one thing. I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. Now this is the dig site, next picture. Um, this is the dig site after one day, okay? So this is our first day on the dig site. And I'll show you the fifth day here in just a second. Now, I did find, next picture, I did find while I was there, um, this is the day, on, this is the fifth day. And so you could see as we start to go down, the rocks forming. And up in the far right, the upper, I'm sorry, upper left uh, corner of my square, that's our little square there without our tarp over it, on that far right where uh, Catherine is, is digging down deep in that hole, that's the corner of the wall of Ai coming through the top of our square. Um, and so we were digging in these areas, and there was a lot of different levels, but uh, you can see as we, as we went down and down and down and brushed away uh, all the, all the uh, dirt, you could begin to see what AI used to look like um, because nobody rebuilt on this site after uh, Joshua's destruction of the city. So go on. This is what uh, your pastor looked like um, 25 years ago, maybe, 25, uh, in 2000. So yeah, about, about 25. Um, that's a sling stone. Uh, I, that was the only thing that I found in my square that was not pottery or chicken bones uh, because you found things that they ate inside the wall. But I found a sling stone that probably, or at least in my mind, it came from Joshua's army. Um, but, uh, you know, it's flint on the inside. You could tell uh, the, the sling stones pretty obviously. So, and then the, the last picture is um, Beth Avon. This is the valley that toward the end of this chapter, and you'll probably read ahead, um, but uh, the, the valley here is where they would have gathered and ambushed on the second attack. Okay, and so we'll get to that in a minute, but you can see how the valleys were, were narrow and you could slide a few thousand men up there to do an ambush. And so just to get a little picture in your mind of what we're looking at, this was the Judean wilderness. So when you think of wilderness, don't think of, uh, of Alaska or don't think of jungle or don't think of, uh, you know, the Rocky Mountains. When they say wilderness, it means rocks uh, and lots of rocks. Um, we had a shepherd on our site, uh, Abu Abraham. He came through every day and brought his sheep with him. And I wondered what in the world the sheep ate because there was nothing except for rocks. I guess they ate rocks. I don't know. Um, but uh, I didn't put a picture of Abu Abraham, although I had several of those on there. Um, but uh, just to throw out a couple of things, because the spoiler alert, and we'll get to this next week, but the spoiler alert is that what we saw in uh, the first part of the chapter with God saying, all right, this is what has happened. This is why you lost. And we'll get to the specifics next week of what they did about it. But this morning, here's what I want to do. Um, what I want to do this morning is, is talk about some of the results of, of this breach of faith. That was in the first sentence of this uh, chapter where it says the Israelites broke faith. 
So we're going to talk about that this morning. So four things really quickly. Uh, number one is defeat. Defeat. Um, and you see that in verse four and five. We just won't reread it for time's sake. Uh, but defeat came, 36 men were killed, and everybody retreated. That had never happened. The Israelites were undefeated with the exception of the uh, attack where they decided they weren't going into the promised land in Numbers 13, and then they decided to go to the promised land, and God said, no, I don't think so. Um, with that exception, they're undefeated. They go into Jericho. They see this mighty miracle that God does like we saw last week. The walls fall, and the town is taken, a big city, a walled city, um, a very fortified city. And everything just falls flat. The Israelites jump right in, take the town, burn it to the ground, and everything's devoted to destruction. Okay, it was an offering to God. And so what happened there was these guys were fired up. They believed they could charge uh, hell with a water pistol. I mean, they just know God is right there with them. They, uh, they're, they're ready. And they get the report, it's a small city. You don't need to send everybody. We don't need to march around this thing. I mean, we're not talking about the whole army. Just send a few because it was uphill and uh, a long way. Jericho's down by the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on the earth. It's 1,400 feet below sea level, okay? And so anywhere from the Dead Sea where Jericho is, is up. Um, and so they were going up to Ai. He said, don't worry about sending the whole army just send a couple or 3,000, everything will go well. And yet, they broke faith. And 36 people died in a little tiny town, beat them down, chased them down the valley, killing them along the way. And so they were defeated uh, because they had gotten confident, but it's not so much because of their pride or, or that sort of confidence. The reason that they lost was verse 1. They had broken faith. Now, it's interesting here, and it's something we want to follow all down through the text and the thought today, was that in this text, there is one person who sinned. One person. And yet we know 36 more people died. Later, you're going to see more people die. Here in the text, he charges not just one person of sin, right? He charges who? The people of Israel in verse 1. It says the people of Israel broke faith. You only had one guy that did anything. But the people of Israel are, are indicted of breaking faith. And we see the same thing down uh, in verse like 10 uh, or 11, sorry, where it says Israel has sinned. You had one guy. It really makes us think as a congregation Okay, as a congregation, if we are doing ministry, if we are uh, doing this refocus uh, process, if we're doing evangelism, if we're doing a building project, if we're building a budget, you know, for the next year, whatever it is we're doing, and we're doing that as a body, as a group, as a corporate, uh, you know, number of people that are gathered together under the name of Jesus that meets at Western Heights. And we have people in our, in, our, in our congregation that sin, only one. Of course, we all sin, but what if there's one who has a major sin that they're hiding under the tent, under the carpet in their tent? You know, we're all guilty, at least in this context. Now, that's an idea we'd want to flesh out and, and go through. But my point is simply this. Your sin, the things you go through are not just your own. This is a, a classic example of the fact that your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects your family. It affects this church body. It can affect our town. Your sin doesn't just affect you. That wasn't even in my notes. That's free. But... Those things we need to understand. It's important because that's what's taught in this text. We are one. We're together. We're under the body of Christ here at Western Heights. We're together in this. But there was disobedience. 
That's exactly what God said, do this, and Achan didn't do that. And so they lost. A good, uh, I think, parallel example I, I found the other day, I was reading, and there's a battle um, that the Romans were fighting in 216 B.C., and they named all the generals, but these Roman generals, they had like four or five names, you know, Pontius, Galatius, Pilus, all these ones, and there was two of them. So there was one Carthaginian general named Hannibal, and so you may recognize his name. And he did this, this, this strategy that he'd come up with called a double envelopment strategy. And so the Romans had all these superior numbers and they're, they're confident, so they just start crashing right into the center of the line uh, for the, the Carthaginians. And, and what Hannibal had done is he'd made the center intentionally a little weak. And their job was to draw them in, basically, begin the fight, and then start to back out just a little bit, just a little bit. And the Roman flanks, what they were supposed to do was hold their positions and advance forward. You know, let the army push in the middle and then come through. They're going to they're gonna go through Hannibal's army like an arrowhead, okay? Hannibal's army backs up. The flanks for the Romans... They failed. They were disobedient of sorts. They didn't advance. And so the fighting on the flanks became really vicious, and the Roman army was drawn in, and they were pushed back. And all of a sudden, before they realized it, Hannibal's army had surrounded the Romans on every side because the outer flanks backed up. They did the exact opposite of what they were supposed to do. And it was one of the greatest, most embarrassing battles of the entire Roman history of war. Because they were, that, that army was almost annihilated. They were slaughtered. Because flanks were disobedient to their command. That's what happened here. God said, don't do this. Achan did it. And when they go to take the next city, 36 men die, and they're chased down the mountain. This group of people that had God knocking down walls in the previous chapter. And so you've got this, this defeat that happens. And, and I just want to tell you, when you or we as a congregation act in disbelief, because that's really what happened here. Okay, Achan was told, don't do this. He did it anyway. Because he didn't really believe that he would get caught. He didn't really believe that God uh, would do anything about it. He really didn't believe it would harm anybody else. When you and I act out of unbelief or rebellion or, or disobedience, on the norm, we will experience defeat. And it may not be some crashing, terrible thing that happens in our life. It, it may not be something that, that crushes us, that would cost lives of other people, but it may be something like in your prayer life where you just seem to have difficulty being consistent. Or you feel like you're, you're hitting the ceiling and your prayers aren't going any higher. You're going to feel defeated. That sin that you've been trying to beat you know, you've been memorizing the scripture like I told you last week, and you're trying to kill it. Not going to have victory. Now, is this a, an absolute, does it always happen like this? Not necessarily. But you may have a grudge that you're holding, and that thing is going to beat you. If you can't be obedient to what God has called us to do. And it will turn into bitterness. You'll struggle to, struggle to minister to your spouse or your neighbor or your coworker, or your classmate because of areas of disobedience in your life. Comb through your own life. I mean, even, even now, comb through your own life to see where the areas of, of disobedience might be because it's important to your life. It's important to the life of this church. It's important to your family. Are you doing what God has called you to do so that you don't experience defeat? Second thing, 
that you can experience is confusion. You saw Joshua's reaction. And it's found in, in verse 6 uh, and following. But again, we, we probably just, we won't read that since we're out of time. But confusion is something that Joshua experienced, okay? When they were defeated, it was a small city, it was 3,000 people, and Joshua there in verse 6, when the news came back, he said, whoa, what happened? And he, you know, he, he fell on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, put ashes on his head and prayed and said, Lord, what, what, are, what are we doing here? He said, I wish we would have just been happy over on the other side of the Jordan. You know, what he meant was we could have stayed over there with the, the two and a half tribes and there wouldn't have been cities to conquer and it was fine over there. He said, I wish we'd just been content to be over there, Lord, because you're going to bring us over here and, and, and destroy us? And then he says, what, they're going to snuff our name out. What will people think then of your great name? I love that. I love the fact that, that Joshua is concerned about the fame of the God of the Hebrews. What will the nations hear? God, this is your great name on, on the line here, so to speak. Of course, you know, in our own lives, confusion is something that can happen at, at, at many levels. But if you and I are in active disobedience to God, confusion is something that we probably will experience. I mean, have you ever had tragedy in your life that, that you don't understand? I think we all have. And we do, we, we get confused and we, we wonder, we call it to God and we say, God, why is this happening? I think it's okay to ask why. It's okay. Some of you feel bad about asking why. It's okay to ask why. I don't think it's okay to call and to question his character when you ask why. You ask why with an open hand, saying, Lord, you're not obligated to give me an answer. I believe that you're good either way, but why? That's what, that's what Joshua said. He, he tore his clothes. That's a sign of repentance. Ashes on the head. That's a sign of repentance. And he asked God, why? Joshua and the leaders and the nation was guilty. Why, Lord? Think about a, maybe a child that's involved in a, a little, small child. Parents go through a, a divorce and the kind of feelings that they may feel. Maybe, you know, it's their fault and, and what did they do to contribute to this and, and things like that. When we all know as adults, it, it's not their fault. But they have a hard time understand they're they're confused and and it's hard for for them to understand and the sin that's in that that's it's problematic in the in the breakup of a relationship didn't come from the child it's probably a whole lot of the places that it came from and every situation is different but it didn't come from the child sometimes those tragedies happen that we can't make sense of doesn't, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't come into our minds. We can't think of a reason. From an earthly standpoint, from a human standpoint, we can't think of a reason at all that thus and so happened. But we know that God's there. We know that something is there. Now, is, is every scenario in our life where there's tragedy, does that mean that God is, is somehow you know, calling us uh, to account or uh, disciplining us? No. It's not what that means. I mean, think about the, the, uh, the man born blind in John chapter 9. Jesus says he didn't sin. His parents didn't sin. It's all for the glory of God. And so we know that there are, there are things we would understand, tragedy, uh, hardship, suffering, pain, that is not directly due to the sin in someone's life. But if we have particular lifestyles that are sinful or, or particular sins that we're dealing with, there will be discipline if we're God's children. Now, when I say that, I mean that if we've been born again, if we've been saved, and God does not discipline us when we dive headlong into sin, we should be concerned, okay? I mean, the writer of Hebrews tells us that. It says, if you can sin and not be disciplined, you may not be a son, that's scary. It ought to scare us. 
if we can sin without discipline. No one sins in a vacuum, though. It doesn't just apply to you. It applies to the church as a whole. We will be confused about why things happen, even in the life of our church, if we're not each one willing to get right with God, for lack of a better term. I know that's, that's nebulous and that's cliche, but until we're able to deal with the sin in our own life and disobedience and rebellion, it's going to be difficult for all of us as a church. When defeat is felt and victory is expected, but it never happens, confusion results. So defeat, confusion, weakness. That's the third one, weakness. And it was found in Joshua chapter um, 10 through 12. We'll, we'll go ahead and read that just so you'll see where this is coming from. Joshua fell in, or after Joshua prayed there in verse 10, it says, The Lord answered, Lord said to Joshua, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things they've stolen, they've lied, and put them among their belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They will turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. And I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. That's interesting. Weakness. Joshua immediately hears from God, which God's silent sometimes in our lives. That's not fun, but Joshua immediately hears from God, and he says, all right, listen, Joshua, somebody took the devoted things. Remember, those were, those were everything in the city was devoted to destruction at Jericho, except for the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron. Those were supposed to be put into the treasury of the Lord. And so Joshua said, somebody, I mean, God told Joshua, somebody in Israel broke faith. They committed treachery. That's what that word means. It means treachery. It means rebellion. It, it means a break of covenant. The word break faith or broken faith there in verse 1, it was typically used in marital infidelity uh, or a breach of covenant between Israel and God. That's what that means. It's a serious word when, when the writer says break faith or broke faith with God. And so Joshua got this answer and he said that until this issue is remedied, you won't be able to stand before your enemies. I mean, this is kind of like the whole point of the promised land, right? This is the whole point of, of the conquest. This is the whole point of taking the land, is giving the land to the people. And, and God tells Joshua, you're not going to be able to stand before your enemies. You're gonna, this is going to be a repeating theme in your life, Joshua. They're going to turn and run. Big city, small city, lots of an army, small army. You're going to run. Because they won't stand against their enemies if they're sin. He said, until you take care of this, Joshua, until this is fixed, until you deal with the devoted things, he even says Israel is devoted for destruction. That's scary. They're going to be weak. In Jeremiah chapter 38, this is, uh, this is right before the destruction of Jerusalem, right before the Babylonians came in, to destroy, this is, I really just, I heard this and learned this again in the last two weeks where uh, we've heard, um, we've been reading through Jeremiah, and God told Jeremiah something really strange. Um, he says in verse 17 of chapter 38, he's speaking to Zedekiah, which is the last king of Israel uh, there in Jerusalem, the last king of Judah, the last king of Jerusalem. He says, thus says the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel. If you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But, in verse 18, if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, same name, same people, different name. And they will burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hands. So Jeremiah tells the king something what I would think was strange. He tells the king, surrender. 
When Nebuchadnezzar comes and his army, surrender. If you want to live, if you want to see the city not burn to the ground, surrender. I'm like, well, that's odd. Now, you know what Zedekiah did? He didn't surrender. You know what happened to him? They gouged out his eyes when they came in anyway. The soldiers ran. They captured the king. They killed the soldiers. And then they took all Zedekiah's kids and they killed him, killed them right in front of his face, then gouged out his eyes so that the last thing he saw was the death of all his kids. God said, surrender. Why? You can't stand before your enemies. I'm sending the Babylonians. They're gonna, th- this is the captivity. This is the fact that you've crossed the line and the captivity is coming. Discipline's coming. You're out of here for 70 years. We've been telling you about this already. It's coming. I've promised it. I've sent you prophet after prophet after prophet to tell you, and you haven't listened, so now you're going into captivity. So surrender. He said, nah, I don't want to do that. Sometimes it's easier just to come clean. Sometimes it's easier on everybody if we just admit our sin and deal with it, right? Got a book on my shelf. Well, we don't have time for that story. So, When we have intense times of suffering and, and weakness, sometimes we get to the point where our tears dry up. We've cried so much we just can't cry anymore. Could be pain, could be financial situation, it could be crisis or sickness, could be the loss of someone, can't get a good night's sleep. When we get that week, God is strong. He's able to move the mountains, to flatten them out into the plains. He's able to forgive sins. Some of you need to, to be saved today. He's able to forgive sin, and you're going to be spiritually weak until you get saved. Sometimes this weakness and suffering is due to sin. Sometimes it's not, but you can always repent and make sure. Things draw your heart away from where they should be. That's what happened with Achan, and we'll talk about that next week. And then with that comes weakness, and again, You remember, this is one man who sinned and caused the entire nation. God says the entire nation cannot stand against its enemies. As we prepare for refocus, we have got to get serious about how our lives are with Christ so that we can go through this without hindrance. Last thing, number four. This is probably the scariest. This is, this is probably the worst of all the things that, that were results of, of rebellion and, and broken faith. Look at verse 12. You've got to read this. I've read it once, but that's okay. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before they, their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. Last sentence, watch this. I will be with you no more. Did you hear that? I will be with you no more. The presence of God would not go with them anymore. It's kind of like when Samuel woke up that third time, right? He woke up after Delilah had pressed him and pressed him and finally came and cut off his hair and he jumped up, going to take the Philistines. Samson, the Philistines are on you. And he gets up to take him as usual and he doesn't know that the Lord has left him. That's what the text says. It's kind of like... It's kind of like Saul after he rebelled and he didn't do what God told him to do during the, the, uh, the taking of the, the Amalekites and he brings back some sheep and brings back some, some people and brings back some gold and all this stuff. And Samuel calls him out. He says, what is this that I hear? The bleeding of sheep in my ears. And he says, oh, we brought that back as a sacrifice. And he said, you've rebelled. And rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. And just like you've rejected God and his 
word, his commands, he's rejected you from being king. This is like, a, and this is kind of a redeeming one, but if you remember in, in Exodus, golden calf thing, you know, God's like, all right, that's it. I'm going to wipe them all out. Start over with you, Moses. Moses said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. What will all the people say? You know, the nations surrounding that God brought them out here, just kill them all. He says, okay, I won't kill them all, but I'm not going with you any longer. Y'all going to the promised land, I'm staying right here. Of course, that didn't mean physically that God was staying right there. It meant that his presence would not be with the children of Israel. But what did Moses say? He says, he says God, if you're not going with us, we can't go. He knew that the presence of God was that important. And in our lives, the presence of God is incredibly important. You can't operate in the Christian life without the presence of God upon you. The active, daily, moment by moment, vine, sap flowing into your life, presence of God. You can't operate in any sort of victory like they found out without the presence of the Lord. And he said, until you deal with this, I will be with you no more. That's tough. That's hard. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And, and we, we can ask the, the question, okay, in our lives if the Holy Spirit was taken away from you, and I don't mean in the salvation way, but just in a presence way, how would your life be without it? Would you just operate as normal? I mean, do we actually live supernatural lives in the fact that we require the presence of God in our regular daily life? Or would you be fine without his presence there? And when we know he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, we know that the Holy Spirit doesn't get taken away from us. But I think we need to ask the question when we sing, when we pray, when we get into the Word of God, is the presence there with you? Is, is he there when you respond in the response time today? I, uh, I read of a tragedy this week. A man named Scott Stevens, back in 2012, um, was a CFO of a big company in Steuberville, um, and was just, he was a father, he was a husband, had three children, three daughters, um, and on the 13th of August, he took his own life, 2012. He was 52 years old. Of course, the question is, why? Why could that be? Well, there was a lawsuit filed in a federal district court, U.S. district court, um, that was a wrongful death claim against a casino. Because this man from the 2007, what, this is what the lawsuit said, from 2007 until the day he died, he was a regular patron at Mountaineer Casino Racetrack and Resort where he was hopelessly addicted to the slot machines. And the lawsuit in its technicality talked about the, the way the slot machines worked and operated and were made and were designed to, you know, generate an addiction and et cetera and so forth, but... This man had embezzled over $7 million from his company. He had drained their 401ks, all their uh, savings. He had even spent his college uh, savings fund for his kids. Spent everything. And then he began to go into debt. Even after he was fired and he was uh, charged with embezzlement, he continued to go to the slot machines, even the day he died. That's the kind of thing that brings destruction to our lives. Not, not just gambling. It, whatever it is for you that you hold on to, that you hide under the tent, 
that will bring destruction. And we could list out a list, not just the Baptist biggies, but all kinds of things that we find ourselves captive to. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we, we just thank you for your mercy and kindness in our lives. Um, we would ask that you would just do a work in us, Lord, that, that we can come to you and that you can forgive our sin and as individuals we can experience victory and hope and peace and freedom. And Lord, as a church, we would also experience revival, revitalization in the power of the Spirit of God resting upon us. So speak to your people this morning as we respond. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.